This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Alan Anthoven, who is the Mariner S. Eccles Emeritus Professor of Public and Private Management at Stanford University. Professor Anthoven, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Seattle and raised there, a beautiful place for a boy to grow up. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Oh, a great deal, a great and deal. And they were from? Uh, my mother was French and my father was English. Mm -hmm. And her father was a professor at the Sorbonne. And his father was um, a partner in Lloyd's of London, in one of the parts of Lloyd's. And um, so they came to Seattle and I think that um, one thing is that uh, even though practically my whole life I didn't leave the Seattle area except to go to Victoria, Canada, say, that um, this background gave me kind of a large worldview. What, was there a lot of talk about world politics, world events at the dinner table? Uh, quite a bit. And so was it inevitable that uh, you, you went into the grappling with these big public policy questions, or was that bug uh, uh, get you later when you were an undergraduate? Well, it's kind of a set of curious chances, but uh, I came to Stanford as an undergraduate, majored in economics, and I was excited by the potential of economics to better understand and mitigate some of the world's great problems. Um, then I went to Oxford, and uh, there uh, I met Harry Rowan, who had come from the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica, and we were in the same uh, Master of Philosophy in Economics postgraduate program. And we became good friends, and then he started telling me what he'd been working on, and I thought, wow, this is really important stuff. I mean, this. <laughs> You know, the world is hanging on the balance of our getting this right. So Harry um, arranged that I would come to the Rand Corporation for a summer between my two years at MIT where I was working on a PhD, got my PhD. And uh, so I spent a summer. My boss was Charlie Hitch, who subsequently became president of the University of California. And uh, we were working on major issues of nuclear strategy and, and related questions, and also with uh, pioneering and kind of methods of analysis and thought of, about those. So that's really what got me into national defense. And, and it must have been a, a really exciting time intellectually in, in terms of the, the ferment. And, and I, I guess what you were shaping was what we came to understand as system analysis. Is that, yes. is that, yeah. Yeah, that's the, um, <laughs> we developed the term systems analysis because uh, although it was broadly under the aegis of the economics division and Charlie Hitch, uh, we needed an, a disciplinary neutral term because one of the great things that Rand did was genuine interdisciplinary problem solving research. And so we economists of course knew that what we were doing was applied economics but we needed the help and cooperation of political scientists and engineers, physicists, and so forth. And so we couldn't say they were doing economics, although some of them were very good intuitive economists. But so we, uh, we were studying weapon systems, so then the term emerged uh, weapon systems analysis. And, and this would have been what period, the late 50s or? Well, this whole, this took place through all of the 50s. I f first came to Rand in uh, the summer of 55 and then came back as a full-time employee 
in the summer of 56, so I was there full time for the late 60s, late 50s. And, and so it was uh, McNamara who, when he was appointed Secretary of uh, Defense by President Kennedy, brought the, this team to Washington. Talk, talk about that and how the, the package that you put together in the Pentagon. Well, uh, yes, I had no particular connection with uh, the Kennedy people or McNamara, although I was sure hoping that uh, Kennedy would win. Uh, in fact, I think we were off uh, touring in Israel when the election happened. But so I came back and um, then, and I was working in the Pentagon, that is Charlie Hitch's suggestion. I took a year's leave from Rand to work in the office of the Secretary of Defense to kind of get a better picture of what it was all about. In fact, I'd said to Charlie, you know, the decision-making process is just all messed up. I'd like to write a book about it. And eventually I did. <laughs> but Charlie said, you know, a good idea for you to go to the Pentagon for a year or so and experience it and, you know. And learn. this would have been what year? The well, this was the late 50s. I see. Before Kennedy, yeah. Yeah, before Kennedy. So in 1959, we moved to Washington, D.C., and I went to work in the Pentagon. Then the next thing I heard was Kennedy elected, picked McNamara, and I remember we hadn't had such a good impression about uh, Engine Charlie Wilson. That is, our RAND group didn't think that he the was. The previous Secretary of Defense. Previous Secretary of Defense, yeah. And so a little bit the reaction was, oh, I don't think we need another automobile company executive. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we didn't know what we were talking about. So he, McNamara, then McNamara uh, picked Charlie Hitch. The Kennedy people, Ken President Kennedy had split off a team from his campaign to do what they called the talent hunt. And they uh, compiled dossiers on leading candidates, regardless of party affiliation, regardless of whether they supported Kennedy, just leading candidates for each of the cabinet jobs and the sub-cabinet jobs. So McNamara uh, was no nominated, and then he interviewed people on his list, met Charlie Hitch, and I'm told and can understand that it was love at first sight. Charlie had just written a book uh, called The Economics of Defense in the Nuclear Age. And uh, it laid out a lot of, you know, what McNamara is looking for, serious, disciplined, quantitative analysis of, of issues. So Charlie became the Assistant Secretary of Defense Controller. And right away, Charlie called me and said uh, he'd like me to come over and be one of his deputy controllers. Pretty exciting times for a 30-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. And and your your mandate was to put together uh, a systems analysis team. How did you go about doing that? Because I remember at a time when I was in high school, you know, there was much talk about the whiz kids, and, and yeah. that was you and your team. Well. Let's see, I, I remember Charlie Hitch explaining to me the vision, which um, he said, what I want to do to introduce into this is programming and systems analysis. Programming was a new method of planning, of financial planning, which would group the dollars by weapon systems and strategic commitments, you know, like strategic retaliatory forces and where is all the money going, so that the Secretary of Defense could control that. Um, and uh, so my first assignment was to work with people that he brought in who were more budget process and system kind of people to get that up and going. So when that was up and going after a few months, then uh, to break off and to create the Systems Analysis Office. And what we were to do was you might say, serious, disciplined, uh, quantitative analysis of issues of requirements and strategy. How much is enough and what should the strategy be? And, and you put together a team. How did you go about doing that? I mean, I, I gather well, you were recruiting the best talent from all over the country. Yeah, well, um, you know, I had going for me that Kennedy and McNamara had generated a lot of excitement and glamour 
and Charlie Hitch was a major player too. The Rand Corporation, which had previously been fairly secret, and it was now getting a lot more visibility. So I had, I had the wind at my back in doing this. Uh, I remember just uh, bright guys showed up somehow, uh, <laughs> like uh, Joe Peck, who was a professor at the Harvard Business School, at, um, and then David Steger, who was a Rhodes Scholar at New College Oxford with me, and was at the uh, Federal Reserve and was an economist. And I persuaded him to come over. And uh, Vic Heyman was a very bright young political scientist and, and he knew somebody who knew somebody who knew me. And so I interviewed him and thought, yeah, this is good. And um, so after a while I got a little more systematic about it. Um, one great source was um, that quite a few, I say young men because at the time this was kind of a man's operation. Now there are women in this business doing a great job, which I welcome, I'm all for it. But anyway, if I say young men, it's because that's what it was mm -hmm. at the time. And um, so there were quite a few uh, young men getting their PhDs in the disciplines I wanted and needed in economics, for example, or in you know mathematical sciences and quantitative disciplines. And so I started getting help from the personnel offices of the military services in bringing in uh, ROTC lieutenants and having them do their tour of duty um, working for me. And got some just outstanding talent that way. One was Larry Lynn who, um, became the head of the kind of mobility and transportation studies. Um, another was Les Aspen, who also had been at Oxford and then PhD at MIT in economics. And Les came to work for me and also just very bright creative. And a remarkable thing about him is that uh, when he finished with us, he went back to Wisconsin and ran for Congress, was elected to the Congress, and I still remember the joyful day when he first said he wanted to be on the Armed Services Committee. And I had been given a very bad time by Mendel Rivers, mm -hmm. the uh, chairman of the Armed Services Committee from Charleston, South Carolina. And one day, Mendel Rivers, I guess, uh, had somehow gotten on the wrong side of too mem many members of the committee. And Les Aspen. Can unhorsed him and became the chairman. I, it's probably a little vindictive of me, but I was so happy when I heard that news. And then Les went on later to become Secretary of Defense. Help uh, our audience in the general public understand systems analysis. Your, your book, which I recommend, and just recently read How Much is Enough, uh, which has been uh, reissued, uh, uh, helps us understand that what you were what, what was new to what you were doing besides bringing economic analysis was trying to look at the larger picture yes. and, and to look at weapons acquisition, for example, in the context of other presidential goals and to tie that to the actual budgets, how much do we want to spend, what do we uh, really need, and, and break. So in addition to seeing the whole, you wanted to uh, understand the complexity of the parts. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> Good description. I would say on the understanding the whole, the big picture, uh, as sometimes when questions would come up, McNamara would say, Alan, first start with the grand totals, okay? The big picture. And <laughs> then work your way down. <laughs> and so in our office, we jokingly called that McNamara's first law of analysis was start with the grand totals or the big picture. Um, so also a tradition that we brought from the Rand Corporation, I might say, by the way, that also some excellent people came to work for me from Rand uh, that I'd known and worked with at Rand, several of them, and they became important leaders in the scene. Um, and the kind of the founding legend, if it wasn't a legend, it was true, but um, back in the early 50s, the Air Force came to Rand and said, we would like you to study the question of 
where should our air bases be located? Because, of course, there are uh, 535 people on Capitol Hill who know just where they should be <laughs> in their district. And um, so we need to have some analytical, systematic basis for where the air bases should be and why. And so uh, Albert Wolfstetter, who is just truly brilliant uh, leader in this line of thought, you could say he was the founding thinker, if you like, recruited, among others, uh, Harry Rowan, who I'd met at Oxford, and Fred Hoffman, who was also in the economics division. And they did a study called the Selection and Use of Strategic Air Bases. And the first thing is they looked at the question and said, you know, this isn't quite the right question. We have to first ask, what are we doing here? Why do we have this Air Force anyway? What are its purposes? What, what are the broad purposes that we can explain and defend to the president and to the American people as to what this is serving? So um, in the process, they kind of completely overturned the previous conception of what strategic air, for, air warfare was about, previous conception being it's just uh, World War II with uh, nuclear weapons. You know, we're going to fly repeated sorties, you know, <laughs> dropping a nuke here, a nuke there, and so forth. And uh, Wolfstetter, Rowan, and Hoffman uh, thought this through and said, well, wait a minute. Uh, one thing is if you embark on that kind of a war, when your bombers get home, there may not be any bases there because the Russians might have just wiped out the bases. And especially we had a lot of overseas bases which would be quite vulnerable to Soviet bomber and or missile attack. So they kind of boiled it down finally to the key insight that um, the purpose of these forces must be to survive a Soviet first strike that was intended to destroy them and then be able to strike back and inflict unacceptable damage on them, such damage that the prospect would deter them from attacking us. So, so the, uh, you, sorry, go ahead. So it's, it's, think more deeply about the question, is that really the question? You know, keep right, deeper that, and deeper to... to and, and so what, what, in, what in, in, the, in, in the process of your analysis, you're really raising questions about assumptions, about how this fits together with something else, which then leads you to say, as you just said, well, what are the goals here? Do we, do we really want to be doing this? Now, in doing that kind of rigorous analysis, you, you really ignited a, a firestorm of protest from the military, as I understand it, who were used to getting whatever they wanted because it was for national defense. Well, I think the firestorm of protest sometimes got magnified a little bit by the media and the press and by some politicians who thought that would be useful for their purposes to attack Kennedy and Johnson and so forth. Uh, I had great personal relationships with a lot of the military leaders. And um, so I, I think firestorm is um, too strong a purpose, it, a phrase. It's true that we did overturn some of the basic modes of thought. That is, for example, in the Eisenhower years, the budgeting was done on a kind of incremental basis that, um, okay, Army, Navy, and Air Force, we can afford about 3% more next year, so you prepare a budget that's last year plus 3%, and then we'll kind of work from there. And because we were introducing these very fundamental questionings of the whole thing, uh, we didn't take that for granted. In fact, at first, we're saying there are no predetermined limits on the budget. This is national defense. It's crucial. Mm -hmm. Survival is on the line, so we're going to really figure it out. And um, without any presupposition, we might end up with a bigger army or a smaller army. And, uh, and in fact, one of the big things was uh, our strategic what, what Kennedy named strategic retaliatory forces, because that's really what they were meant for, were dangerously vulnerable on the ground. And this is what Wolstetter and Rowan and Hoffman showed in their report, that all of our strategic retaliatory forces could be wiped out by a relatively manageable number of Soviet missiles. And so that was extremely dangerous, especially when 
coupled with our NATO strategy, which was threatening to start a nuclear war if they attack us. You, you write in, I think in How Much Is Enough, no large organization is likely to pursue automatically the broader national interest as distinct from its own parochial or institutional interests without external forces and leadership. So o over time, you're, you're saying you were able to legitimate what you were doing because it, you, you were opening up a new way to think about the national interest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, looking back, what did you learn from this uh, uh, experience of bringing rationality to public policy in uh, a domain which pushes so many buttons? I mean, national defense is national defense, and if we're not doing it, my goodness, what will happen? Well, uh, I'm smiling at your question because I've often been asked. And I say, well, what I learned was that the ideal weapon system is built in 435 congressional districts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it was very interesting because, of course, by the Constitution, we have three branches of government that are separate and equal. And the Congress are elected by their constituents, uh, presumably to serve their constituency, to do what is best for their constituents. And there's a certain conflict there because bringing home the contracts and the bases. So sometimes I felt, well, they don't care too much about whether the weapon system works or not as long as it's built in their district. And I'm not putting them down. I'm just saying it's natural. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, They were hired by their voters to do that. So I learned then about kind of the conflict between, um, you know, I felt we had our, got our legitimacy from the fact that, one, the president was elected. Two, Kennedy had campaigned quite explicitly on military strategy. I thought it took a lot of courage for this unusually young man running for that job going up against the great general because he was criticizing Eisenhower's strategy, saying, vulnerable strategic retaliatory forces on the one hand. On the other hand, over-reliance on the first use of nuclear weapons in Europe. You know, that was called tripwire and massive retaliation. Soviets crossed the line, bam, General LeMay bombs them back to the Stone Age. So um, we felt, you know, now we understand clearly, and it's the job of the president, the secretary, et cetera, to explain to the American people this is what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. That is, of course, going to generate a lot of controversy in and out of the Pentagon, in and out of the Congress. What, was that a unique leadership, the, the combination of Kennedy and McNamara in, in terms of uh, uh, foresight and a willingness to, to fight these issues out? Well. Um, I think it was an unusual combination, but you had two men who were unusually committed to thinking the thing through and taking a stand and fighting for it rather than the usual thing, which is just, uh, I remember what Adlai Stevenson said about uh, Richard Nixon once, that man who sails downwind whichever way the wind is blowing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think, and McNamara, an exceptionally pow powerful mind. Uh, of course, a Berkeley graduate. Mm -hmm. um, Which made all the difference. Made yeah. all the difference. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, uh, he just loved to really dig into things. In fact, I remember one of the other deputy controllers uh, sometimes would call McNamara the senior analyst. Because mm -hmm. we'd do some analysis and bring it to him. and. It wasn't a case of just presenting it for rubber stamping. He'd dig in and tear it apart and, and uh, very stimulating for me. You know, when you say, what did I learn? Well, I learned that um, it was possible to think more deeply, more critically, to think through a, a problem. And, and I guess it was important for you and your team to have the support of these two leaders. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. Absolutely. Because you weren't always treated well by Congress, I get the impression from Th the book. That's right, yeah. Um, uh, especially 
the Armed Services Committee had a lot of um, people from the South who were, uh, I think, often uncritically military, pro-military. Now, I was pro-military too, but I, I felt we have to get them pointed in the right direction. Uh, you, you, you left the defense field in the late 60s or early 70s and moved in uh, to health care reform. Uh, how, how did that and why did that transition come about? Because uh, clearly you, you've taken the two big problems of public policy. Was that intentional? Well, um, let's see. A couple of things happened about the same time. I left in early 1969. Uh, I uh, decided I'd been in national defense for 12 or more years and I'd like to do something new. And besides, uh, Nixon had made a campaign promise to root out the whiz kid approach from the Pentagon. So I didn't feel I was going to be welcome with them. So I decided I, I was going to, during Nixon's inauguration, I'm going to drown my sorrows with my family in powder snow at Sun Valley. And then from there, transition. Well, so in the late 60s, I had become acquainted with the man who was president of Georgetown University. And at the time, the board of directors were all fairly elderly Jesuit priests. And they had made a decision, it's time for us to bring in some kind of modern younger men. And who might we get? Well, I would graduated from a Jesuit high school and kind of remained friends with some of the Jesuits. And so I guess they thought of me as a reasonable candidate for that. And in fact, what they had in mind was that some of the thinking that I would brought to the Pentagon was probably also applicable to education. And they were forming, they didn't call it systems analysis office, but it was like a systems analysis office for, the, for Georgetown University. And interestingly enough, later on, Charlie Hitch tried to do the same thing here at the University of California. Therein lies another story. So there I was at Georgetown University. And the most critical financial issues were the medical center. Hmm. I'd started on the finance committee and said, you know, I'd better get over there and dig into those. So I really dug into the university medical center. You were a policy advisor or at, at Georgetown? Oh, I was on the board of directors. Oh, on the board of directors. Yeah, I was on the board of directors okay. of the university. Yeah. yeah. And I was on the medical center committee of the I board. See. Right. Yeah. And really studied all this stuff. One of the me most memorable developments was that um, the Department of Community Medicine was studying what is the future of medicine? What, where is this going? What's it going to be? So that we could reflect that in how we teach our students. And they had concluded that uh, the future ought to be a prepaid group practice. And uh, I studied all that and joined them. And in fact, it resonated with me because I grew up in Seattle. I had a newspaper route up on Capitol Hill where Group Health Cooperative of Puget Sound built their first hospital. And I followed that, you know, kind of with some interest. Oh, this is like Group Health Cooperative. Great, you know, so I learned more about it. And I reached the same conclusion. Th this is the only tenable, as one conservative friend of mine said later on about Kaiser Permanente, this is the only tenable bastion of private enterprise uh, in American medicine. That is something that, you know, can be self-disciplining and self-regulating. And so I was impressed by that. Then uh, I decided I wanted to go into business. Nothing to do with defense just into private commercial business. And I went to Lytton Industries, based in Beverly Hills. And after a time, I became president of Lytton Medical Products, partly based on the fact that all my studies of uh, the medical business at Georgetown gave me some background. So there I was, uh, head of a multinational medical technology company. And I got more and more interested, again, because I could see where the market was leading us was not good. It was to more and more complexity, the latest, fanciest thing. Didn't matter, you know, cost effectiveness be damned. Uh, just, you know, give us the, the latest thing without any serious evaluation of the 
benefits versus the costs, something that's still a major problem in uh, medicine. So then um, uh, I was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, which is kind of a high-level body of uh, people meant to come together to advise the government on healthcare policy. And I got very interested in that too. I thought, wow, this is, you know, I went to some of their meetings. I enjoyed these discussions. So then when R.J. Miller, who was the dean of the Graduate School of Business at Stanford, was trying to create what he called a public management program, like a little bit like a Kennedy School within the business school, um, and he recruited me to Stanford, and I decided uh, that's what I think I want to work on. The great thing about being a tenured full professor is you can follow your stars, for better or for worse. And so I was a little ahead of my time, but this was 1973. I just decided the way healthcare was organized and paid for, we were just really asking for trouble. This was going to grow and grow and grow and eventually uh, strangle us financially. Uh, as I mentioned to you, I, I was reading your book uh, on the plane and at the same time reading some of your articles that you sent me about medical care reform. And uh, I, I was struck by the similarities. Obviously, there are differences between these two public domains. So I'm, I'm curious, yeah. as you grappled with this problem, and you sent me two articles which you wrote in the 70s, which really laid out the landscape. I mean, they're, they're absolutely uh, uh, quite a read in terms of being uh, both logical and, and sort of grappling with, mm -hmm. with this medical reform system. So my question is, was it, did, did your work in the Pentagon and the political experiences you have there informed uh, you, or was it really the system analysis and the opportunities that <clears throat> you were presented with that, that gave you a kind of a feel for this? Well, I think the systems analysis ex experience helped a lot. For one thing, the point of entry was we really need to have serious ways of subjecting medical technologies to such evaluation and analysis so that we don't spend the whole national income on stuff that's not really productive. Uh, and also, my background as an economist, that um, uh, economic incentives matter. And I looked at fee-for-service medicine and said, this is what now people are coming to understand more generally. This is paying for volume, not for results. Uh, and the thing I liked about prepaid group practice was uh, <clears throat> the doctors don't get more money for doing more things. The enterprise prospers if they can keep you healthy and well. And uh, if you have a medical problem, solve it in the most effective and efficient way. So, uh, you know, it was the same person thinking in there. One case, also I think with national defense, I remember uh, doctors would come into our board meetings in their white coats and so forth and pound the table and say, we absolutely ha have to have such and such. And I did have the reaction, yeah, I've met people like you before. I called them Admiral. <laughs> 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 and uh, like they wanted, to, wanted us to, to build a new hospital not far away from the existing one because everybody wanted to be together in the same building. And I remember one of my fellow board members saying, you know, for a tiny fraction of the cost, we could hire a limo service that every five minutes would drive people <laughs> from one hospital to the other hospital. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I, it just impressed me, in both cases, that people were not looking for alternatives that gave value for money. So intellectually, there was a good deal of similarity, even though there's a great deal of difference. But also, issues of life and death and values and what is this all about anyway? And, and what, what the conclusion you come to, even in the early articles, was really that the, the, the system, because uh, you had perverse incentives, was essentially calling what it did uh, free enterprise, uh, consumer choice, but that wasn't the reality. And, and that, in fact, uh, it was not producing uh, the best product for the most people. That's right. 
it wasn't producing the best product. It was producing, in both cases, there was a problem that it was pr producing what seemed best for the producers. Mm -hmm. I mean, we get back to the problem of the traditional military method of budgeting and so forth, and there, a career interest was a lot at stake. I don't want to impugn the military again because I had such many such good friends that I admired so much, but um, on your fitness report, uh, it certainly was reflected whether you behaved in such a way as to advance the interests of your military branch. And if you were a submariner, then you'd want to see more submarines so you'd have a greater opportunity to be a captain of a submarine and so forth. And with uh, medical care, sort of a similar process. If you do more and do more expensive stuff, you'll be more rewarded not only with money but with prestige and other resources and so forth. And, and it, it, it seems that it's the vested, it, it, here you are trying to bring rationality to uh, uh, an important domain of, 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 uh, of, of the, our public budgets and what you're encountering is vested interests yeah. and best vested interests that have evolved over time. Mm -hmm. So in the case of, uh, of uh, uh, health care reform, you confront the fact that especially after World War II, part of the contract negotiations with labor created incentives to produce uh, health insurance that created uh, systems that wanted to spend more and more money and had no, no clue about cost and right. the greater good. Right. That's right. Yeah. That's why I, I felt what I'd learned in my experience at Georgetown was so valuable because prepaid group practice is a distinct alternative to that. That is, this is a case of teams of doctors who accept responsibility for managing the quality and the cost and for giving their enrolled members some value for money, which was very different from the rest of medicine. So prepaid group practices were unfairly attacked, criticized, reviled, et cetera, on and on, which led me, when I came to Stanford, to find my way over to Oakland to the headquarters of Kaiser Permanente and talk with the CEO and the executive vice president talking about what I'd been doing and saying, I, I believe in your cause, can I help? And uh, I remember Jim Voves, also a Berkeley graduate, who became the CEO and a very good friend of mine, saying, well, Alan, we've come all this way without a consultant, but what the hell, let's give it a try. <laughs> let's give it a try. And here, 37 years later, I'm still a consultant of Kaiser Permanente and value that uh, connection. And, and what, so, so in this book, toward a, 21st century health system, uh, the, the, the collection of essays you've gathered here with your uh, co-editor uh, really focus on the virtues of the prepaid system a, as opposed to the fee-for-service system. And, and help us understand what it is, what is the, re, the, the, the result, the, if we're doing a system analysis, if you have fee-for-service payment, what, what are the consequences for the whole system? Well, I think the main consequences are that uh, the system keeps expanding uncritically. That is, some new technology will come along. For example, a coronary artery bypass graft surgery for someone who has clogged coronary arteries and therefore some chest pain. Um, well, some creative and progressive heart surgeons developed, that's probably Dr. Shumway at Stanford and others, developed that operation in which they would take a vein or an artery from elsewhere in your body and make a bypass around the clogged artery. And that became a billion, and this is at a time when a billion dollars is a lot of money, a billion dollar a year industry before the publication of the first randomized controlled trial. Uh, so essentially, before there was any evidence as to whether it really did any good for the patients or not, and there were prominent physicians, sort of medical men rather than surgical men, who questioned whether that was valuable. And in fact, the experiment 
showed that it only prolonged lives for a small subset of all the people who were getting the operation. So it was just lacking in evaluation. And because the whole mentality with, I, I usually call that open-ended fee-for-service because there's no prospective budget. You know, the patient is suffering, the doctor's been trained to help the patient, the doctor wants to do what helps the patient and not to think about the cost. Uh, and you don't particularly want the doctor to be thinking about the cost at the bedside, but you'd like somebody upstream to be thinking about overall which technologies give greater value or not and so forth. So along comes prepaid group practice and well, they have several important basic ideas, one of which is teamwork, but one of which is the group as a whole are responsible for the results. And let us say Kaiser Permanente has made a deal with Stanford University that they will take care of our employees for $400 per person per month. Doesn't sound cheap, but it is our lowest cost plan. And uh, so then the doctors, okay, we now have a duty to figure out what's the best way to use this money on behalf of our patients. We can't act like money is no object in this kind of a framework. So, so in a way, the, the, the organization uh, creates an environment in which you get uh, systemic thinking yes. and analysis, right. just as a byproduct uh, of, 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 the, of the way things uh, uh, are organized. Now, when you first started writing, I get the impression you thought that it was going to be easier to convince uh, employers uh, and others uh, uh, and physician to make these changes, but, but you found out that wasn't the case. Well, it certainly wasn't the case. It was a lot harder than I'd. I think probably I'd been spoiled by the Kennedy and Johnson and McNamara experience that you've got some smart people in charge. They study issues, listen to reason, and will act on evidence. Now we get to healthcare and nobody was in charge, um, which is all right. But um, I came to believe the consumer ought to be in charge, the informed, cost-conscious consumer ought to be in charge. And importantly, you, you don't think government re re regulation is the answer because you, you, you make a very interesting argument that government regulation tends to favor uh, the producers and, and create uh, uh, monopolies yeah. uh, that don't take account of the consumer. Right. Government is inherently responsive to those with the resources to influence government. There's nobody on Capitol Hill really speaking of, there are a few, but you know, generally speaking, they're not, they're not uh, driving for what's best for consumers. You know, they're driving for what they think is best, which they wrap up in the mantle of, of consumers. But um, I just, I think that's not the same thing as doing what, let's say, you have at the University of California, where as an employee you are presented a menu with a range of choices, and. Um, that is in terms of health insurance plans. Yeah, yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah, in terms of the health insurance plans you have. It's similar to what we have at Stanford. So the employer says, um, we will pay, we give you this range of choices. As far as we can tell, these are all good quality, reputable, high quality people. So we're not offering you El Cheapo or something we wouldn't want our family to be in. Uh, and here are these choices. If you want something that costs more, it must be because you see value there. And so you pay the extra cost. And so both at the University of California and at Stanford, 80% of the employees choose prepaid plans, not open-ended fee-for-service. That's pretty remarkable. And, and interestingly enough, you, you see a major change that would be for the good if, if on the one hand there is at least two choices of plans, and the employee is given a fixed amount that they will be reimbursed for the plan they choose. But what the irony is, 
this has been hard to implement beyond places like Stanford and Berkeley. And I think you say that only 10% of employees, uh, employers give their employees these choices, which would have really revolutionary implications yeah. in terms of the cost of the system. Right. Well, that's right. And it's, uh, uh, it's, it's fairly disappointing because it has revolutionary implications for the organization of the system because what I described about University of California and Stanford is also true in other settings where um, the employer offers employees choices, but cost-conscious, responsible choices. In Wisconsin, with the state employees, they have a similar model. And over 90% have chosen prepaid plans. So it, I see that c informed, cost-conscious consumer choice is the thing that ought to drive, the force that ought to drive the system in the direction of giving people what they want and giving them the most value for, for uh, money. And you, you say that the you, you weren't able, or, or th this way of thinking wasn't able to in uh, uh, convince employers to make this change. And, and at one point you say in your new book that the, you, you didn't recognize it the way the short-term interests in the face of these problems would work against long-term solutions or choosing them. Yeah. Well, I think each employer, understandably, it's a little like what I was saying about Congress before and how they're set up and what their job is. Each employer's job is to look out for the best interests of the shareholders. And by the way, because of the way uh, stock markets work, fairly short-term interest of the shareholders. So you'd be reluctant to do something that might depress quarterly earnings this year in exchange for something better in the long run. You might, but you'd have to convince investors that that was a good idea. So um, then employers looking at it, should we offer a number of choices? Well, one thing is if they're small, it's just too expensive. I mean, at Stanford, where we're dealing with, and University of California, you know, where you're dealing with a bunch of different health plans. Well, you have to manage those contracts. You have to make the contract. In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't need to be very expensive, but for a small employer, that would look very costly. Then, I think another problem is that historically, the organized medical profession was always putting down the idea of prepaid plans and I think wrongly implying that they're somehow second rate or not as good. There's still a hangover of that in our culture. So a lot of employers, they want to use uh, their employee benefits to attract employees. So they want to give what they think the employee will find most attractive. And even large employers, where it wouldn't cost so much, just have not um, thought that offering choices, including prepaid plans, uh, is something they really must do. I think one of the problems, by the way, that's very important in the whole thing, is public policy. That is, the tax laws as they exist today uh, exclude from employee taxation the um, employer contribution to health insurance. So that biases choices in favor of more costly um, and is a powerful economic force pressing in the direction of just open-ended fee-for-service. Oh, what do you care if it that's because you know, it's a tax-free thing, you know, so if you're upper income, well, the government's paying about half the extra cost, so why not just um, stay with uh, open-ended fee-for-service? Now, I keep thinking at some point this is going to get so expensive that some employers are going to have to wise up. And in fact, over the years I've written about the idea they could get together one way or another and form exchanges, uh, which would resemble, for example, what we have in California with the California Public Employees Retirement System, CalPERS, which is an expanded version of the University of California, if you like. And they offer a range of choices, and they broker these choices. Well, they're so big, they care for 1.3 million people. So the administrative costs are very small, like one half of 1% of 
premium revenue because when you're doing it on a large scale, it's, it's not costly. So what I've hoped employers would do is see a way to get together and uh, form exchanges where they could offer their employees these choices. Uh, with this background, both in defense and then in healthcare reform, give us your reflections on the recent debate and the, the Obama reforms that emerged. Overall, was this moving in the right direction or was it so half-baked that, that you, you don't reach the systemic changes you want? I think it was a huge disappointment. Um, the, Obama didn't provide serious guidance of where this ought to go. Uh, I could just see the medical industrial complex descending on the White House and on the Congress, and they deployed huge resources like $1.2 billion spent on lobbying campaigns and so forth. Remember one day the pharmaceutical people came in and made a deal with Obama, we will support uh, health reform for, uh, it will contribute $80 billion over the next 10 years. Well, that's a very small volume just to get 30 million more paying customers. That's not even a good volume discount. I mean, that's 1% mm -hmm. or so of their expected revenues. So then others came in and yes, we will support health reform, but it's always on our terms that we will be able to preserve the existing system. And then with the Congress, I think some were just so eager to get more people insured, which is a valuable, worthy goal, uh, that they were willing to overlook the issues of costs. So um, the medical industrial complex was able to fight off any serious uh, strategy of cost restraint. So in fact, uh, to me, the net, net bottom line on the Obama plan is that the actuaries at HHS who are well-regarded independent people did a projection of health care spending after the legislation versus before the legislation and found it increased spending somewhat. Not usually, but somewhat. So here, Obama, Orzag, and other people ahead of time were saying, we've got to get the spending under control or it's going to strangle our economy, a judgment with which I completely agree, and then go along with something that is designed by the Congress and the interest groups, uh, which doesn't get spending under control. And I just think that's a huge disappointment. I think it's not sustainable. I think one way or another, the uh, American people are just not going to stand for it. I don't know how it's going to be, how it's going to play out, but one way of putting it is we already had two or three large open-ended entitlements that we couldn't afford before this one came along. So we had Medicare for the aged and disabled, open-ended entitlement, fee-for-service. So then we have Medicaid, similar, although changing more to managed care. And then the tax the exclusion of employer contributions from employee taxable income, which has powerful incentive effects, as I explained, and costs well over $200 billion a year. So we've got those going, which have to be reformed, and instead uh, mm -hmm. they add a new one, which is government subsidies to low-income people to buy them into the same defective, fundamentally flawed system, then you're going to say, well, what do I think they should have done? And I do have an answer for that, which is? <laughs> <laughs> Please. Yes. Um, Senator Ron Wyden from Oregon, usually considered a liberal Democrat, I think a bright progressive guy, he studied at Stanford, can't be all bad, teamed up with uh, Senator Bob Bennett from Utah, generally considered a conservative Republican, alas, not conservative enough for some of his home folks. And they created a kind of market-based reform that looks a lot like Consumer Choice Health Plan, my 1978 articles, uh, in which 
um, everybody would have a range of choices. If your income was low on a sliding scale, the government would help you to buy you in. Everybody would have to buy health insurance because if they don't, if they're free to insure or not insure, then what will happen is only the sick will buy insurance and the, you get an upward spiral in the costs. And uh, there would be what they called health help agencies uh, to kind of broker the whole thing and oversee it, take you by the hand and put you in front of the computer, whatever it is, and say, here are your choices, look over the information, pick the plan of your choice, and then pay more if it costs more. And they got 16 uh, senators, eight Republicans and eight Democrats, to co-sponsor this. And um, that was the right general idea. Now, as soon as you put something out there, oh, this or that, or, you know, people have a lot of little objections. Mm -hmm. Well, that's something you can manage in the political process, but I felt that's the right idea. I mean, that's the idea that could work, could bring satisfaction to the American people. It's worked well for the universities, for the state of Wisconsin, the state of California. Not well enough because there are too many people still out there in open-ended fee-for-service. The system is still dominated by the inflationary incentives. One final question. Uh, if students were to watch this program and uh, see what you tried to do in defense and in health care, sort of bringing rationality to uh, public debates on issues that really push a lot of people, what advice would you give them? to prepare uh, for uh, uh, carrying forward the mantle? Well, one thing is uh, I'm a little hesitant to claim the mantle of rationality. You know, like I'm rational, therefore you're non-rational, therefore you're no good. <laughs> is rationality does depend on values and on objectives and, and goals. And so in the Defense Department, we found we needed to develop what we called it explicit criteria of the national interest that we could state and defend. And interestingly enough, other people, although what they really wanted was the factory in their district, uh, were a little embarrassed to get up and say, no, that's the main thing. Because the American people were told, we're going to get you an efficient, effective defense. Well, in healthcare, uh, what I'm saying is proposing is economically rational from the point of view of the consumers who have to pay for it. And it's not rational, if you like, you know, from the point of view of the medical device makers who would lose money in the world I'm talking about, or the, I think it'd be fine for the doctors, they're gonna make out one way or another, but um, uh, there'd probably be less hospitalization. So some interests would not be well served. So going into it, you just need to be aware of that and to be willing to think through what are the values and interests that I'm willing to, to believe in and willing to defend and then kind of work back from, from those. Well, on that note, uh, and I think it's a hopeful note because <laughs> despite the difficulties in these policy processes, uh, I think we, we move forward. Uh, I want to thank you uh, very much for taking the time to come to the campus and be on our program. Well, it was a real pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I want to thank our audience also and make note that uh, <clears throat> this is the uh, 500th uh, interview in our series, which uh, started in 1982. And uh, I want to thank uh, all of our listeners uh, and viewers for watching us on YouTube and on satellite television. Thank you very much.